Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, Alice was a grad student at Berkeley, UC Berkeley, uh, under Michael Jordan, and she graduated in 2005. And she was also an intern in the uh, old signal processing group twice in 2000 and 2001, where we worked on AutoDJ stuff. Uh, but lately, you've been at uh, uh, CMU mm -hmm. and uh, as a postdoc, and, and she's going to talk about, well, I'll let her give her the title of her slide, but please welcome Alice. Thanks. Okay, so I want to talk about statistical failure debugging today in uh, software and systems. Um, so why, why are we interested in failure diagnosis? Well, because failures are very common. Uh, for instance, how many times have you seen this message in the past week when you're trying to access some website? Um, or if you're like me, then you have painful memories of the gray screen of death of Mac OS X. <laughs> And there, some of you might also remember the Mars rover Spirit, which failed due to a software bug 17 days after landing on Mars. So the problem with failures is that they can be very costly, and not just in terms of neg negative publicity generated by, uh, by, by, by the bugs themselves, um, and loss of customers, loss of revenue for the software company involved. It could also lead to performance degradation, um, and even system compromises in the worst cases. And dealing with failures take a lot of time and energy. So for instance, it took uh, a whole team of NASA scientists working around the clock two and a half weeks to find and fix that bug on the Mars rover. And the question that I want to ask today, today is whether we can do better. So our goals for debugging uh, is first of all we have to admit the defeat in that there will always be bugs. So uh, a study done by Computer World uh, claims that on average there is about 10 bugs at least per thousand lines of code that, that an average programmer writes. So we can't possibly catch all of them before deployment. Yeah? I didn't think it would be linear. Bug rate. Uh, that's, the, that's the stat they, they cited. I don't know how they aggregated the uh, the statistics, but they probably just you know counted the number of bugs and then just averaged over a number of a number of lines in the code. Um, I'm not saying that if you write just one line, there's 10 bugs, and if you write two, there's there's 20. Anyway, so there's a lot of bugs in in the code, and you can't catch them. Is is the point uh, before deployment? Um, so our goal is to get rid of the bugs as soon as we can and to get rid of the bugs affecting the most number of users. So how do we do this right now? Uh, largely manually. So um, if I have a small program um, then, and I, that I want to debug, then the first thing that, I'm on, that I might do to try to debug that program is simply insert a whole bunch of printf statements. So everywhere where I think the uh, Everywhere where I think the value of that, variables is, that variable is important, I will add some printf statement, print out the current value at that point, run the program, uh, look at what, what it does, and things like that. The problem with this approach is that it, it's not very scalable. So the stats that I can find is that Windows XP has 40, over 40 million lines of code. I don't know if that's really true. Um, but we can't do printf statements for everywhere for 40 million lines of code. Other debugging approaches, uh, things like GDB or Visual C++, run into the problem that what if your program crashes only after 20 hours of runtime? Or what if your program only crashes when you're also running an MP3 player in the background or something like that? So in short, manual diagnosis is difficult because of the thousands of software and hardware components at stake. Um, that are in, typically involved in a large system. And it's difficult because you have to deal with all kinds of different bugs. So you have to kind of um, uh, worry about you know, catching all different kinds of failure errors when you're, when you're debugging a program. So some companies have started collecting crash feedback reports. Um, 
for instance, every time the Mac, Mac browser Safari quits, I can send in this report that contains a simple stack, um, maybe some other tiny bits of information like the path of the program, the other libraries that are loaded at the time, etc. Um, and what the company might do on the back end is bucket the report, these reports by stack signature and prioritize the debugging efforts based on the size of the bucket. So what the tool that I'm going to talk about, which I call statistical software debugging, gives you something like this instead. Um, it has a, basically it's a ranked list of predicates. Each predicate is basically a specific condition um, associated with a specific line in the, in the file and inside some function. So this list says it seems that the condition stir comp not equal to zero is um, associated with uh, 15, 28 number of failed runs. And these things are listed in order of the number of failed runs that they're associated with. And if you click on each predicate, you can bring up a list of related predicates. So these are all the predicates, all the other predicates that seem to uh, affect the same set of failed runs. So this automatic debugger tries to simultaneously isolate multiple bugs. And I'm going to show you how the this, this system enabled an outside programmer, someone who's never seen the source code before, to find and fix bugs, three long-standing bugs in some real-world program in less than 20 minutes each. So a quick overview of the system. Um, we start with the program. We instrument the program. I'll tell you more about how we, what, what I mean by instrumenting and what do we do there. Um, we disseminate the instrumented version of the program out into the field where users run this instrumented version as opposed to the normal version. And we collect runtime reports from all of these program runs and um, analyze the successes and failures to try to locate the suspicious looking uh, predicates that are bug predictors. So I'm, I'm going to focus mostly on, uh, well, sorry, I'm first going to go over the instrumentation and data collection process to give you an idea of what kind of data we collect. And uh, most of the talk will be focused on the algorithmic challenges and what do we do to analyze this data. So this is joint work with Ben Liblet, uh, my advisor Mike Jordan, Alex Aiken, and Meyer Nayak. Ben and Alex and Mayur are software engineering folks and they focus mostly on the software, the, the instrumentation and collection part of the system. Yes? Just as a quick note, it seems like this approach actually probably isn't very appropriate for the Mars rover that you mentioned at the beginning, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, that was just a motivating example of why we care about failures in general. Yeah. Uh, we can't, we can't have a thousand Mars rovers all landing on Mars and, and running amok and collecting data from them. Right. Okay, so the instrumentation framework has this goal of collecting detailed useful information for debugging. So we want to do this on each run of the program and we want to do this on a lot of internal variables inside the program. Um, the what the report that we get out might look something like this. We have a bunch of program predicates, um, specific conditions, return values of, of function calls, um, and the data is how many times that predicate was found to be true during the, that run of the program. So as a small example, we might suppose this is the code that we start out with. If x is equal to zero, then we go into some loop, we execute this function y times. After instrumentation, um, all, of these, all of these predicates get automatically inserted into the program. So for instance, we check every branch statement and count the number of times that that branch statement is true or false. And at every integer scalar assignment site, we compare that integer uh, scalar to all the other variables <coughs> and constants that are in scope at that point. And for function calls, we with an integer return value, we again compare the return value against zero. Um, because oftentimes in C programs at least, um, programmers use the return value of a function to indicate the exit status of that function, whether it succeeded or failed. 
So given so there so what ends up happening during instrumentation is that hundreds of thousands of predicates get automatically inserted into the program. And we can't possibly execute every single one of them at runtime, so they're sampled, which creates problems later on that I'll talk about. But in the meantime, so here is our instrumented program, and here might be a program <coughs> report. Um, we have, uh, we, we see that the, the, branch, the branch statement was observed once, it was true once, it was false zero times, and for the scalars, it was observed X number of times, and how number of times is true or false. We also have, the, we also have the success or failure label of that run. So success is, is pretty simple. It just uh, succeeded without any problems. A failure could e either be a hard crash or incorrect behavior, anything that the user might label as incorrect. And we collect a bunch of these program reports. That's a success. This might be another success. And this might be a failure. So the, the thing that we want to find is uh, we want to zero in on, for instance, this predicate because it only happens during failure. And if you look at, uh, if you remember the, the original snippet of code, you see that y, i, the loop counter, is in fact never supposed to be greater than y. So the fact that you observe i being greater than, that, that i being greater than y is true in this, in this report um, is correlated with that failure. Okay. So that's a quick overview of the instrumentation and um, the type of data that we collect. Are there any questions so far? Okay. So now I'm going to concentrate on the uh, algorithm part. What are the difficult problems um, for, for this application? Um, before I delve into the algorithmic challenges, I'm going to use this validation experiment to illustrate a bunch of our results. So MOSS is a software plagiarism detection program. It has about 6,000 lines of code. And after instrumentation, we ended up with about 200,000 predicates. And the data set that we collected had uh, a roughly 17% failure rate. Those failures came from eight old bugs that were re-injected into the program. These were either common programming errors or bugs that had been found during previous, uh, in, in th real bugs that were found in the program during previous revisions. So in difficulty, they range from simple null pointer dereferences to array overruns to violations of high-level programming constructs. Who's the author of Alex Aiken. So we have the source code. Bearers. <laughs> well, so. <laughs> um, Sorry. Yes. <laughs> In short, well, the, the the null pointer, some of the simpler bugs, we just are we just injected into the program. They're just calming program errors. Oh, that I, I thought, oh okay. So so they were com they weren't. Some uh, of them I had existed. That when you say reinjected old bugs, I, I thought you meant bugs that Alex made no. that you reintroduced. Okay, yeah, that, that was confusing. Some of them are bugs that were never in the program before, but they're just common programming errors that we put into the program for the sake of experiments. Okay. Yeah, but some of the some of the bugs did 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 exist. The more complicated bugs didn't right. exist okay. in the okay. in, in the program before. Yeah. One small question, when you're <coughs> injecting the predicates into the code, is that something that's being done manually, or do you actually have some automated process? Auto, automatically, um, yeah. Doing so we, we, we check all the branch statements, and we check all the integer scalar assignment side, and we check all the function return values, for instance. Yes? Are you try putting mutation errors in? What errors? Mutation errors. Um, you read, uh, this is what well, the idea was back probably long before you were born, um, <laughs> of in, uh, changing, say, uh, less than into a greater than. You, you mutate values um, in the program code and see what uh, effect it has on the behavior. Yeah, not for this experiment. Um, we haven't. I, I, I don't think that would be a challenge. That would be uh, different in, than, I think that would actually be an easy error for us to catch but we haven't experimented with that in here. Well, there was a theory at that time that if you made a mutation 
and it didn't affect the behavior of the program. Mm -hmm. uh, but line of code probably uh, isn't relevant, is to the program. relevant to the program. I see. No, we haven't experimented with that. Not here. Anyway, so the, the reason why we re-inject these old bugs is in, for this validation experiment is so that we know the ground truth and we can verify the results. Okay. So normally, we, for instance, we wouldn't know um, as much about the bugs uh, as, as, as our controlled experiment here. So here's a pro problem definition. Basically, the input is a set of program reports that contains these predicate truth counts and it contains the outcome labels. And the outcome, the desired outcome, is a ranked list of program predicates. Um, hopefully we have one group, one self-contained group of predicates per bug, where the definition of a bug is something that leads to crashes or incorrect behavior. And that can, that's represented by a single predicate. So we're looking for single predicate con conditions that, um, that tell us um, what caused the, the, what's correlated with the failures. Okay. So, um, so the goal of debugging is... Sorry, could you give a clear statement of what incorrect behavior is for this particular program? Or? Just basically anything that the user might denote as incorrect. It could be incorrect output, it could be something taking too long. So how, how, I mean, is that determined for each kind of program you would want to test? Like, does it, how much manual effort is, is required in deciding what would be incorrect behavior for a given piece of code? Um, it's all, it's purely manual. Um, the crash is easy. Which right? is, the crash is easy. All of the, most of the bugs that, that we have in the validation experiment is, are crashes. Some of them are, it generates incorrect output, but we have the correct version so we can compare and automatically determine whether or not it, there was incorrect output. Um, but because, because the system is meant to be used in the field, the users will, are the ones in, in practice that sends back these reports. So they can easily annotate each report as failing or success, or successful. But it, w it would require it a would general require, piece of code. Yeah, unless you're just trying to catch hard crashes, which, which is easy. OK, so the goal of debugging, even for the one, uh, single bug case, is to find the single predictor for each bug where a good predict predictor is something that's only true for this bug. Um, now, if, there's, if, the, if your data set contains just one bug, then it turns out several solutions work. And to illustrate the, these solutions, I'm going to use something called bug histograms. So for each predicate on our list, we might have one of these bug histograms. Oops. Uh, one of these bug histograms where the y-axis are the number of runs in which this predicate is true and the x-axis uh, denote bug IDs. If there's only one bug in the program, then trivially all the bug histograms look the same. They're all, um, they all concentrate on this one bug. And unfortunately, programs contain multiple bugs in general. Uh, I know that fact to be true for Mac OS X. So, uh, so the ideal outcome in that case is we want one predicate for each bug. And the ideal bug histogram might look something like this. Um, I've ranked the, so here's a list of predicates. Um, each one of them has its bug, uh, bug histogram. Uh, each one of them concentrates on one and only one bug. And they might be ranked in terms of the, their popularity of how many crashes they, they account for. So first question that we want to ask is whether we can treat this multi-bug problem as a single bug problem to make our life easier. So we tested that assumption on using uh, one of the single bug algorithms, which is a two, basically two sample t-test, um, where we test each predicate independently of all the other predicates and compare the probability that that predicate is true in failing runs versus successful runs. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, and yeah, you, you can think of it as a new 05 problem. They, 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 I think they do something, they think they're doing something different, but this, this is essentially what they're doing. Um, and here's the outcome on MOS. So here's the top 10 predicates, 
And what comes out are, you see that we have multiple predicates all focusing on the same bugs. So the, there's, there's a bunch of red, there's a bunch of pink. Um, and we have predicates that cover multiple bugs. Um, I'm going to talk more about this kind of predicates later. Uh, these are what we call super bugs that cover, loosely cover multiple bugs but are not very useful for debugging any single one of them. Um, so in short, these predicates that we get out from the single bug, uh, single bug algorithm are redundant and they're useless for finding out where the bugs are. And, it, and they don't cover all of the bugs. So unfortunately, we can't reduce the multi-bug problem. We can't just treat the multi-bug problem as a single bug problem. Why are having multiple predicates bad? I would think that multiple predicates might be useful for somebody going in and looking at the code and saying, oh, these are two different conditions. Oh, I understand this one, and this is the source of the bug. Uh, they are, in fact, useful. But uh, what's lacking here is a form of organization, I guess, because you, you don't actually get to observe the, um, the bug histogram. In, you don't actually know the bug histogram in practice. So if the, the programmer has to go through each predicate on the list and look at what, what's, look at what it is and figure out um, whether it's an independent bug or something that's the same as what has come before. Yeah? I'm trying to figure out how this also relates to modularity that might be in the, in the software. So I might have a multi-bug program uh, or a multi-bug problem where I, in fact, have two modules that are in my program which are failing independently mm -hmm. of one another, but it just happens that the execution traces tends to cause them to happen in the same runs. So is there some way, so you're basically treating a program as a big monolith mm -hmm. and, exe and an execution um, as a big monolith, an execution of the entire program. Right. I'm wondering if there's some way to partition the execution traces and the programs by modules so that you can split these, these instances where you have multiple bugs in the same run. Yeah. You could somehow split them by modules so that they're more like single, single bug problems. Yeah, that, that is in fact what we tried to do. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go through that okay. next. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the multi-bug problem. Um, I have a bunch of successful runs up here. I have a bunch of reports of failing runs down here. Um, and how do we, what do we do to, to solve this problem of finding out bugs in the multi-bug multiple bug case? Well, if in, in some ideal world, ideal world, if the runs were actually labeled with, um, with the bug label, so suppose we know, suppose some oracle tells us that uh, runs 1, 3, and 5 all crash due to bug number 1, and 2, 4, and 6 all crash due to bug number 2. Then you can analyze each set separately and identify their set of bug predictors separately. So because we don't have the run labels, um, the first natural idea is to try to recover that label. And how do we do that? Well, maybe we can try clustering. So um, clustering a set of runs has the goal of reducing the multi-bug case, multi-bug data set down to k single bug uh, data sets, where we cluster the runs based on the program report that contains the predicate activity patterns. So runs that fall into the same cluster should have the same set of active predicates. Um, here, are the here are the results from applying k-means to the sets of um, failing run program reports. It's a lot better than uh, the results of the simple t-test, but we still have problems um, with, for instance, multiple clusters covering the same bug and clusters covering multiple bugs. So as it turns out, um, what these run clusters are zeroing, zeroing in on are not failure modes but usage modes. And this might be clear in hindsight because um, the usage modes constitute a much larger part of the history of a program. So the user spends most of the time using the program than to have it fail. Yeah? Um, I don't know 
I don't understand why this is the thing that one would naturally try to cluster on first. It seems like the natural thing to try and cluster on first would be something related to, you know, when I got to a cluster, would I be able to find a, uh, a, a good single bug predictor within it or some notion? I, but we, or is that wrong? But we don't have the cluster yet. So first, so this is, first, this is, um, we first try clustering the runs, and then for each cluster of runs, we might try to find a single bug predictor. So this is a first step. I guess I was thinking that if you had a, if, you, if your cost of your clustering was how good can I be at finding a single bug mm -hmm. uh, within the cluster, then that would feed back into how you uh, modify your clusters to look for a better cluster. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think you're you're jumping ahead a little bit. Um, there's definitely this this feedback between the quality of a cluster and the uh, quality of the bug predictors that that it comes up with, and that's what I'll talk about next. Okay. Yeah, I'll talk about that. So I'm what the distance metric for the clustering here? Euclidean distance. Okay. So a predicate is just 0, 1, it's either true or not, is that? A uh, predicate is, actually we're clustering on the actual counts. So it's the number of times a predicate is true. Okay, so Another possibility is um, if, say, the bug predictors were known, then it, we can uh, use that to separate the, uh, cla the, the, the set of failing runs um, into, into different, ty different types of bugs, and then uh, analyze each subset separately to find out all the other correlated predicates. So the second naive try is to um, cluster the predicates and try to recover the, um, to, to hope to uh, reduce redundancy in the set of predicates and to recover the bug IDs. Um, here we chose to use spectral clustering because it respects transitive relations um, that might result from our sampling process. So if, uh, suppose A, B, and C are all equivalent predicates, in our data, because we're doing sampling of the predicates, we might only observe that A and B co-occur and B and C co-occur, but not A and C co-occurring. Co um, we would still like to uh, put a, a, B, and C in the same cluster, and spectral clustering tries to accomplish that. The similarity metric that we're using here is the pairwise correlation between predicates. How often are they both true in a set of runs? Yeah, you first. Um. This this uh, this example does k-means clustering also respect transitive relations? Mm, not as no. I don't see why not. Could you explain to me why not? I guess it does so more indirectly. It just um, you're you're looking at in in k-means you're for each uh, for each predicate. I guess you're uh, looking at how close it is to the to the center of that, how close it is to the, the central predicate in that cluster. Okay. Right, so if, if two predicates are both close to the center, then they would fall into the same cluster. Okay. But we, we are actually looking for the case where, say, say A is the center, uh -huh. um, B is close to it, but C may not be. Okay. Right, so, so in k-means, um, A and B might be in the same cluster, but C would fall into a different cluster. Um, okay, in, in spectral clustering, handles that differently. Special Aren't you still saved by the triangle inequality, or is there like a factor of two that's... Um, spectral clustering uh, has this graph connotation where uh, all, all the predicates are, are, are related by, um, connected by a certain strength. And uh, the clusters are, have, to, to form clusters you basically, you're, you're saying, uh, you pick up one node and you see what other nodes follow it. And so, so um, based on the connection strength. So if you pick up A, then you would have, you would have B following it, and because B is, is following it, C would also follow it. So, so intuitively, cluster, spectral clustering would get you more of this transitive relation than K-means does. Okay. So, 
Other questions? I'm just curious, do you try spectral for clustering runs? Because it seems like, I mean, Kimmins has a number of problems, especially with Euclidean. And prototype based, and you have to pick the number of clusters and so on. So partitional clustering seems like a much better option on that, on the first idea as well. Mm, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. Um, I think that you, for, for clustering, run, clustering runs, we really have the problem that the clusters are not discriminant enough between different types of clusters because we, um, we don't want multiple bugs to end up in the same cluster, right? So we can talk about that more later. Okay, so anyway, um, here are the results from spectral clustering of MOS predicates. Um, it, here, in comparison, here's the ideal case. That's what we would like to get. And here's the previous best result from run clustering. And um, the spectral clustering results are worse because they have, we, we end up with predicate clusters that cover a lot of different bugs and we see, over, we, we see uh, single bugs being split across multiple predicate clusters. So it turns out that spectral clustering doesn't work because of these superbug predictors that tend to link clusters together. These are, pr these are predicates that, are, that occur in multiple different types of bugs and they tend to alias the bugs together into a single cluster. Okay, so let's review some of the problems that we found in the multi-bug case. The fundamental problem is one of missing bug IDs. Um, if we knew which, which bug crashed which run, then we can just uh, separate the, the sets of different bugs separately um, and, and analyze them separately. So the, the several things that we tried are um, trying to recover the bug IDs through clustering runs. But in that case, the problem that we encountered is that we don't know which predicates are important to cluster on. And we don't want to cluster on the entire set of predicates. Um, so the next thing that we tried is clustering predicates. Um, and there it turns out we get these superbug predictors that confound clusters. And a superbug predictor is um, something like a really trivial one is something like, I entered main. I started the program. That condition is certainly true for all failures, but it's, it's not very, so it covers a whole bunch of failed runs, but it's not very useful because it's also true for successes. So that's a trivial example of a superbug predictor. predictor. And um, a not, a, another one, not so trivial one, is um, in, in the MOS experiment, we find that uh, a prominent superbug predictor is the fact that the command line is long. So when the command line is long, it might exercise a whole bunch of options that are, um, that are rarely used and that might contain more bugs. So the uh, failures are, have, have a correlation with the command line being long. But command line being long is certainly not a bug. So. Um, that's the kind of, kind of things that we want to avoid in our, in our result. Some additional problems include these redundant predicates. So um, a list of predicates that all tell you the same thing that clutter up the, the ranked list, the results. And we haven't talked about how do we deal with these sparsely sampled predicates. Okay, so, but the key insight um, is that there is this symmetric relationship that we should take into account. Namely, we should be clustering runs by their bug predictors and clustering predicates by the runs that they predict. Is that a, you have a question? Okay. Um, and that's, that's similar to this idea of bi-clustering that's um, often used nowadays for bioinformatics, um, analyzing micro, micro array gene expressions. So to give you a view of of the type of thing that we're trying to accomplish here. Um, here's an ideal uh, set of data where I've arranged, so, so now I'm representing each run as a row vector and I'm stacking, stacking these runs on top of each other. Um, the y-axis y -axis are the runs, the x-axis are the predicates. Um, the, the color is red if that predicate is active in that run and it's white if the predicate is not active. So here we have 
the ideal data set um, where the, the set of runs are clearly separated into two, two sets. Um, each, each set has its distinct bug predictors. And what happens, what, you, what actually happens is that we have this much larger chunk of predicates that indicate the usage mode. And we might also have the super bugs, super bug predictors that um, might be true across all of the failed runs. Or at least a large portion of them. And of course, in the real case, we also have noisy data. So the predicates don't just behave. Uh, they, they have more random behavior, so they might be on or off, um, depending on other conditions. And the data is not clearly organized. It's shuffled. So our problem is to get from something that looks like this back to something that looks like this. So the algorithm that, that I propose to do that is um, an iterative voting algorithm where the predicates compete to account for failures and the runs cast vote for, for each of the predicates. And the hope is that um, subgroup of runs will reach some, some sort of a consensus on what's the best pr uh, predictor to, um, to represent them. And if we set it up, if, this, if we set up the system correctly, then the strong bug predictors will win in the end. So, yeah. I'm sorry, is this some sort of kind of EM algorithm? It's kind of what it seems like. Uh, it's an iterative algorithm. Um, there's, it's, it's not EM, there's no, it's not, it's not a probabilistic model. There's no, um, there's no hidden, vari there's no, there's no latent variables that, that we're trying to recover. Um, but it's, it's certainly iterative. Okay, so... I, I, I have a follow-up question. Is yeah. there any other framework like EM that, that it can be cast as, a, as an instance of? Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an algorithm that tries to find the fixed point of a set of equations. That, so it's... Um, so, and, and oftentimes people think of fixed point equations, well, one, one interpretation is that fixed point equations try to reach some maxima of some energy function, of some unknown optimi optimizing objective function. Okay, so, but I just chose this framework because I find that to be the most natural way to express what we know about the problem and the constraints that we would like it to, to obey. Okay, um, so, Here's a representation of the type of uh, objects that we have in, in our data set. We have a bunch of, sorry, we have a bunch of uh, failed runs, we, ha we have a bunch of successful runs, and we get a bunch of predicates. So the first question that we need to answer um, in setting up this voting process is how are the runs linked to the predicates? Um, they're linked, runs are linked to predicates um, based on the predicate truth count. But that, that data is sampled, so we want to recover the true relationship between the runs and the predicates. And we do that by building a probabilistic model of uh, when, a product, when is a predicate true in a specific run. And we do that in the hope of reverse, reversing the effects of sparse sampling. So is it sparsely? You don't actually recover in Ben's sampling thing. It doesn't really record every single count every single time. No. No. So uh, does it do it? How, how does that? Uh, what is the sparsity pattern is it deterministic or random? Or? It's random. So essentially, for each each time the program comes across a predicate and that's inserted, it tosses a coin to determine whether or not to take that sample. And that's more efficient than just sampling. That's not more efficient than sampling, but there's other tricks that, 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 that they do to make that faster. So, so, so it actually doesn't toss a, a one coin at each site. It tosses a geometrically distributed coin and counts down to the next time when it takes the next sample. Oh, so um, there's and, and, and there's additional, yeah, and, and then there's additional tricks that they do on top of that to make it even faster. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So uh, just following up on that, is the 
bias in the coin a function of where it is in the in the path in the tree or in the code path? The code path. Uh, we actually do do yeah. So it, so we could either have it just be uniform across all predicates, um, but it's right now. Down a long branch, then you don't get any sample. I mean, you have very low probability of getting any samples down rear, rear branches. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, well, it doesn't matter how long the branch is because each each site is independent, independently. You independently decide whether or not to take a sample for each uh, predicate. Right. But um, but with that said, we do we do do this non-uniform sampling where the so we do some uh, some training runs. You know, on complete, where we just sample everything and and figure out what's the co general coverage pattern. And for for the predicates that are rarely reached, we would have a higher sampling rate than the predicates than some loop variable that's executed ten thousand times in the program. Then th that that has a low sampling rate. Okay, so the predicate truth probability inference mechanism tries to uh, infer what was true given what was observed. Um, so the things that we observe are, so this is for a single predicate, we, we know how many times it's observed and true. And we also know how many times it was observed, how many times it was actually, that predicate is actually sampled. Um, so those quantities I'm going to color green because we uh, observe that in, in practice. What we don't know are the actual number of, uh, is the actual number of times um, this predicate is true in this run of the program. We also don't know how many times this predicate is reached in this run of the program. So here are four random, I'm going to treat them as random variables and I'm going to endow them with probability distributions. Um, for instance, um, the number of times that the predicate is reached is modeled as a mixture between a Poisson variable and the spike at zero. Um, we made that choice because I looked at the, uh, for complete data, I looked at some complete data and for a large number of predicates, the number of times that, that this predicate is reached during a run of the program, if you look at the histogram, it has, it looks like a Poisson distribution. Except for cases where that branch of code is simply not reached that entire branch is not reached in this run of the program. And so um, it just has, the, the, the count uh, is zero. So we have this mixture of, between a Poisson and a spike at zero. And similarly, we can make modeling choices about number of times the predicate is true given that it's reached. So these two um, variables, the probability, distribu the probability distribution for these two variables are made by modeling assumptions come from uh, 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 observations about real data. Whereas these two um, are exact because they are, because they have to do with, the with how we do the sampling. And we know exactly how we do the sampling. So this is exactly a binomial given the number of times it's reached. This is exactly a hypergeometric given, the num given all the other things in, in our uh, system. So given this model, um, uh, we can place conjugate priors for the parameters of this model. And our job then is to compute some estimate, in this case I chose the maximum a posteriori estimate of the model parameters given data. And because we're using conjugate priors, we can write down the posterior probability that a predicate is true in some run J in a closed form formula and plugging in the, esti the parameter estimates, we can just come up with a number. So we, so the first, this first step gives us this relationship um, for each predicate and each run we can write down the probability that that predicate is true in that run given the observed values. So, so that's the first step. Um, this gives us the adjacency weight matrix between the runs and the predicates. So the next step is to um, for each run to decide how much vote to give to each predicate. It's going to do that based on some notion of the quality of a predicate, which I'll talk about later, um, and the adjacency weight. So, uh, so given the, the, this predicate quality, which intuitively should denote how good of a bug predictor that predicate is, 
given that quality score and how, um, how each predicate is related to this run, the run might decide how much vote to give to each predicate. And similarly, all the other runs do that decision separately. Um, so the vote from a single run to a single predicate follows this pattern um, where the, the Q denotes the quality and AIJ denotes the adjacency weight. So how do we define this quality score? Well, good bug, predi good bug predictor sh predictors should have high quality. And for example, um, here's a really simple bug, a null pointer dereference. Um, the fact that pointer is equal to zero is the smoking gun bug, bug predictors that we want to, one of the great big bug predictors that we want to find. It's only true in failures and it's never true in successes. On the other hand, its complement, um, pointer not equal to zero, is true only in successes and not true in failures. And um, note that it's not the case that uh, knowing, knowing this value gives you this value because the data that we have is the, the count of the number of times something is true during the whole run of the program. So both if, if this predicate lies on, in the path of some loop, then you could have both the, the pre, the, this predicate and its complement being true more than, more than zero times during the whole run of the program. Right? So, giving, so knowing one is not equivalent to knowing the other. Anyway, so based on this intuition, um, it's harder to, we don't have generic metrics that take into account this relationship between the predicate and its complement and, uh, and that looks at the successes and failures. So we need to define our own metric that accounts for these differences. So the quality of a predicate I define to be um, this ratio between how, ma how many votes it gets from the failed runs and the number of votes it gets from the successful runs and it depends on um, the opposite ratio of the number of votes that its complement gets from the successful runs and the failing runs. The intuition for this score is that a predicate I has high quality if it contributes a lot to the failed runs but not to successful runs and and its complement contributes to successful runs but not failed runs. Um, and another intuition that you can use is that the, the denominators are essentially acting as barrier functions. They're acting as, as constraints. We really don't want um, a good predicate to contribute to successful runs and we don't want its complement to contribute to the failed runs. Okay, so how do we update this this quality score. So uh, for each predicate, it looks at the number, the number of votes it gets from the failed runs and successful runs. And it looks at the number of votes that its complement gets from the failed runs and successful runs. And it comes up with its own score. And in this case, because both failed runs voted for P1 and both successful runs voted for P1's complement, aggregating everything, it turns out that um, P1 is a strong failure. P1 looks like a strong failure predictor. Whereas for P2, um, P2 in this case got roughly equal amount of votes from the failed runs and the successful runs. And so um, they turn out to be mediocre predictors that are perhaps super bugs <coughs> because they got, uh, they got votes from failed runs and a bunch of successful runs. Okay, so briefly, here's the equation whose fixed point we're trying to find. And it's a nonlinear system. Um, and to give you an overview of the algorithm, um, we, we start with a set of failed runs and, and, the, and the predicates, failed runs and successful runs and the predicates. We initialize the quality of the predicates to be all ones, to be uniform. Because a priori, we do not have any ideas about what is and what's not a good bug predictor without looking at anything else. Um, and we also initialize the adjacency matrix by doing that probabilistic inference and to figure out the posterior probability of the, run, the, of the predicate being true in each run. So uh, after that, we iterate these updates for the vote and the 
the quality, uh, the predicate quality updates until the process converges, um, at which point each run casts a final vote for the best predicate. And we rank the predicates by the number of votes they receive from failed runs. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah. Um, have you looked at whether uh, any program analysis techniques like static analysis or model checking would help refine your quality measures? Yeah, um, I, I haven't looked at it, but that's one of, the, one of the things that I think would be really, really interesting and promising to try out. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about that later on, too. Okay, so before I, uh, before I tell you the results of, of applying that algorithm on MOS, I'm going to review the previous attempts. So again, here's the ideal case. Um, here's what we got from the simple two-sample t-test. Um, here's run cluster. Here's what we got from run clustering, which is the best results that we got so far. It's the cleanest. Um, and here's what we got from clustering the predicates. So our algorithm uh, gave us this result on MOS. So it turns out that right away we notice that bug7 has no independent predictor. And, we, and that's been verified in, in, in our experiment. So we're just going to ignore that bug from, from now on. Um, the algorithm successfully picked out five unique bug predictors for five bugs and two strong predictors for bug number eight and two strong predictors for bug number one. So as an example of, so this is, this is the bug histogram. This is the bug histogram view of the result. We normally don't have this result for a real program because we don't know which bug crashed which run. Um, what we do have are the actual outputs, so the, which predicates are selected, selected to be important. So as an example, uh, in this case, for bug number one in MOS, here's what the algorithm uh, returned to us. And that leads us to these two lines in the program where it, the program is starting to look at C commons and is trying to match lines, uh, doing, doing line counters. And indeed, the bug turns out to be one. Um, it's a, it has to do with a wrong line counter in the part of the code that looks at C commons. So, uh, that in our, in, uh, we count that as a success in our case. So, and armed with this knowledge that it does something useful for the controlled experiment, we went out and got a, a real program, something that we didn't write and we had no idea about, um, EXIF, uh, which is an image processing program. It has about 10,000 lines of code and uh, after instrumentation, we ended up with uh, 156K predicates. So I have to say that we do, uh, we do simple pre-processing to get rid of uh, a bunch of these predicates. Um, but we still end up with thousands of predicates that we have to look through. So the, uh, on this, the status set that we had uh, has a 7% failure rate. Um, So I, I also want to mention that the good thing about our algorithm is that it's, it's linear in the, in the number of predicates times the number of runs. And that's pretty much the best we can hope for because just to process the, uh, the, out, the, the program reports takes time linear in the number of runs times the number of predicates. So it's another reason why we want to set up this iterative process where each run, um, sorry I didn't mention this before, each run um, only looks at its local neighbors, the predicates, right? And, and does its, uh, at each iteration, performs that vote decision separately from all the other runs. And then each predicate um, looks at all the run, all the votes that it gets from, from all the runs and also does a local computation to figure out how, what, how to update its quality score. Uh, yes. How long do you take to run this test? Uh... 20 minutes. Well, yeah, pretty much 20 minutes. Do you ever find cases where it doesn't converge? No, it always converges because the system is set up um, the um, it's we're, we're, we're iterating in a bounded domain. At the end of each iteration we renormalize all the predicate scores so that they sum to some constant. So 
by Brouwer's fixed point theorem, we always converge. There might be multiple fixed points that in the system, but the, one that, the only one that, that we care about is the one that we can reach starting from this uni uniform predicate score. Because unless you have some other, unless you happen to have some other information about uh, how the predicates should be weighted, which I, you know, the only, the only fixed point that you care about is the one starting from the uh, uniform score. So. How does Brower's fixed point theorem apply? Uh, Brouwer's fixed point is a, sorry, I didn't see who asked the question. Oh, uh, Brouwer's fixed point is a general theorem that says if you have, uh, if you have a bound, if you're doing a fixed point iteration in a bounded domain, then you converge. Then you will find a fixed point. What's that? You need some contractivity. Bounded domain. You can just go around. Just because it's bounded doesn't mean it converges. Um, I, I think the, the condition just says as long as it's bounded. Let's go back and forth for example between two points. Um, continuous function, sorry. I don't think that's enough. Well, Depending what's the domain. domain is. What? Depending what's the domain you're talking about. You may not be able to go back and forth see if it's on the top. That usually yeah, have, that's yeah. a domain where people operate in the Iterating belt. And you have some monotonicity? Um, yes, as if the, uh, I, I think, I thought the, um, I, I thought that the uh, assumption for, for Bauer's fixed point is just that it's bounded and, um, and it's continuous. I What's the domain? The domain. Say it's What's the domain? The domain is the the set of predicate quality scores. So it's always between zero and one for all of the predicate. Well, you're just saying that this theorem guarantees that there exists a fixed point. Right. You want your algorithm to converge to a fixed point. But if I start, if if the fixed point exists. Um, if the fixed point exists, then I can reach it from any starting point, right? If you formulate an objective function, could you show that your algorithm improves the objective function value in every iteration? So I don't know what's the objective function that, that corresponds to this set of uh, update equations. Yeah? I think one way to look at this is also a question just about step size. Why? is the particular way in which you're moving in each iteration a good step size of the phrasing that's given in other, in other optimization problems. Right. Why do you not overshoot, undershoot? Is it okay? Yeah. Um. Uh, I, have to, I have to think about this more. We can talk about it later. Um, okay. Anyway, um, applying this applying this algorithm on this real world example, um, we found we found three previously unknown bugs, and if we look at one set of of these bugs, so for instance, um, one set says that the program crashed at memcopy. Um, that doesn't give us very much information. But if we look at the algorithm output, we find that um, if it says that it's, it's correlated, all this, this entire set of crashed runs is correlated with this condition um, where, it, that, where this is true. Um, so the, the function returns without allocating the subsequent data blocks. So Based on the output, you can reconstruct the uh, history of that program um, and, and say that it must have entered this function at some earlier point. It returned without allocating these data blocks. And sure enough, subsequently, it crashed when it's trying to copy those data blocks off to another location. Yeah. How often are the predicates that you find actually once they appear in the code like this? They all appear in the code. 
because the, the predicates are come from specific lines in in the program. Okay. You know, I missed that that you were saying here. You you said it failed in mem copy. Mm -hmm. And then how did you get this on the right? Uh this is oops. This here on the right? Yeah. The the predicate highlighted by the algorithm is the condition that this branch statement is true. What did that have to do with the left? The mem copy. Okay. Uh, it just says that it must have, for the set of runs, this must have happened sometime earlier before it crashed. Over down the right, I'll probably try to copy yeah. it. Try to copy it into N, arrow, and yeah. from bracket I data. Right. It, it tried to copy this data off to somewhere else. Or, yeah, or some, some other data to, to N, entries I dot data. So, well, I'm confused about how that turned up in the report on the right. I thought what you got was what was on the left mem copy. Uh, what we got on the left is the stack. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So if you look at this, if you just look at the stack, that's the information that you get. Okay. But your program returns what's on the right. Right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Is so. Is the reconstruction done? Uh, based on. Well, so this is what the stack gives you, and... Is that mechanically done? It's not mechanically done, no. It's, it was just, we just did this here to illustrate how we found the bug. It would be nice to do it mechanically. It would be nice to do it mechanically, yeah. I don't understand. What, what are you saying it's not mechanically done? So we're not generating, we're not generating a reconstructed program history for for the program results. We, we're just highlighting individual lines in the code, individual conditions in the code. And a, a person went, went, you know, we went through and, and came up with this subsequent logic. Okay, so, um, so doing this took less than 20 minutes. And this is without prior knowledge about the code and how, how things work. That's including the reconstruction of the history. Yeah. Where did you get the test cases to get here? So we actually instrumented EXIF, and we have a public deployment. Um, and we've been, we were collecting data, and we noticed that EXIF has a particularly high failure rate, higher than, than the other programs that we looked at. Um, so uh, we generated the, the, this test data in-house, given the high failure rate. So we just tested with a whole bunch of images from all kinds of different sources. They were hard crashes? Uh, yeah, they were hard. I mean, yeah, they were, they were all hard crashes. Yeah. Well, if you make the box, uh, how, how the failure rate change? So these three bugs constituted the, the entire 7% of failure rate. Yeah. So after we fixed these three bugs, there were no more failures in, this, in, in our data set. Yeah. I have a question. How is fermenting the program influence its, uh, actually its, its performance? So you want to use the instrumented program in fields, but if the performance will be too bad, won't users will just don't use this approach. Sorry, can you repeat the question? So how does the instrument in the program, uh, how does it affect its performance? Um, it depends on the program itself. Uh, we tested the instrument sparse, in the instrumentation with the sparse sampling rate on a set of computation heavy programs. Um, and the overhead ranged from 1% to 70%. But for interactive programs, that overhead is, is less. We haven't done user studies, you know, like in, in real user situations, how that affects the, 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 the overhead. But for programs with tight loops, then the optimization that um, Ben and Alex Meyer did is, doesn't, may not help. So, uh, you first and then. Um, have you looked at um, kind of ramping up the sparseness and seeing where where you start to lose your good effects? So have you tried varying your sparse sampling mm -hmm. and seeing the extent to which, you know, how little sampling you can get away with or how, conversely, how much you need? Yeah, we've done, we did, we did an experiment like that on, on Moss. Um, 
I don't know how, whether that genera generalizes to other programs, though. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering about kind of, you know, the, one of the problems with intersymmetric code is if you're trying to debug race conditions, you change the timing. So have you tried running this on any multi-threaded program and kind of seeing what happens, whether you end up with more bugs, less bugs, stuff like that? So we did run this on a multi-threaded program. Uh, it's an MP3 player called Rhythmbox, and we found some um, more com more complicated bugs that's that relate that's timing related, um, but that takes longer to describe than than this example. Yeah. So, in this example um, that you have on the screen right now, um, there's this one predicate that that all is there in all the failure cases, and it's not there in all the success cases. Mm -hmm. um, are there so? So that and the stack trace are what you use to reconstruct this. Are there other predicates that could aid the user in trying to piece together this history? Are there other predicates that are less of smoking guns but still kind of implicated? Yeah, certainly. Um, in this particular bug, this is the most useful predicate. Um, but in, in a lot of the other bugs that, that we looked at, it, it definitely helps to get a to see what are the what's what are the other predicates in this cluster of predicate to give you a better idea of what's happening and you present to the user then a ranked list of predicates a ranked list and followed if you click on each predicate um, it's always better to look at the you 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 get a, a, a cluster of related predicates and it's all it's often better to look at that cluster than to look at individual conditions how smart are you trying to be in when you're constructing the predicates in the first place? In other words, you might expect that different types of software would have different types of problems. I mean, you know, certainly there are some commonalities, you know, buffer overruns and so forth, but you know, are you trying to be at all clever about that? Or are you just trying to say, we're trying to find a specific class of bugs and this is what this is useful for? So we're not being very clever about what to and what not to instrument. We're, the, the predicates are, are just tossed into the program automatically and they we're trying to cover as much information as we can that and we're we're trying to get information that we think might be useful for general types of bugs um, yeah we, so there's there's more that we can do to to make that more targeted towards specific classes of bugs all right so in summary we have this I talked to you today about this automatic debugger for software programs and the instrumentation and the analysis framework um, and showed you that it, how it simultaneously isolates multiple bugs and the clusters failed runs and clusters predicates. So some of the interesting problems that came up is that um, unlike, unlike the usual machine learning uh, problems, we have this problem has flavors of classification, but with incomplete fail failure labels. It has flavors of feature selection, and it has feature, uh, fail flavors of bi-clustering. But it's different from, it has elements from all three of these problems, but are different from you know, the, the, the vanilla version of each one of these. So, uh, and what I got out of this project is different from the, I guess, the usual machine learning approach where you might have a hammer, and you're just trying to go around and look for problems to solve. Here we're starting, we're taking the nail-oriented approach and starting from the problem itself and trying to find um, a good solution. And there are lots of related work in this area of debugging. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to do probably an unfair survey, but you know, a sparse sampling of, of the current work that's, that's out there. There's a suite of work involving tracking program invariants and expressions and state changes. There's a, a lot of work on static verification and and one perhaps unorthodox, unorthodox example of static verification is Dawson Engler's work on finding bugs in the old, in the old version of the, the Linux kernel. There's also been some um, statistical uh, methods. So Bernal and Eric Hor Bernal and Horvitz um, for instance, worked on uh, using this expert-crafted Bayes net, Bayesian network to supplement um, program analysis to debug a software 
the American Airlines uh, flight reservation system back in the 19, back in 1990s. So a lot of these approaches are geared towards in-house testing, whereas our approach is unique in that it's geared towards public deployment. So the premise is that users are already running these buggy programs, so we might as well make use of those runs and try to de get debugging information for free. Um, and the, the approach that I described today is flexible and, and it tries to handle general types of bugs and multiple bugs gracefully. And it's the only one that we know of that, that tries to do that. So other failure diagnosis projects that I've worked on are uh, failure diagnosis for eBay where we had coarse grain, coarse grain instrumentation and the trade-off there is diagnosis speed and false positive rates. And also a project at IBM on active diagnosis for networks. So the set setup there is we have some fixed network topology, a network of com computers with fixed topology and we have a fixed set of probes that we can send into the network to try to diagnose which node is down, for instance. Um, and the algorithmic, algorithmic problem there, um, the one that I worked on, is how to use probabilistic inference to efficiently figure out what's the next probe to run, what's the next best probe to run given the current outputs of probes that we've already run. And currently, I'm working on this problem of performance diagnosis in a distributed file system at Carnegie Mellon. So there the setup is we have some distributed file system. Um, the user comes in on Monday, runs some job, and the user comes back on Wednesday, runs the same job again, but discovers that this time the system is much slower. So what happened in the meantime? Did, was there a software upgrade? Did some, did some of the components go down? Um, so we try to look at snapshots of containing individual request traces to isolate the problem, problematic component. So I also worked a little bit on social network modeling and link analysis. So in general, I think networks and graphs are cool objects to study. And I guess in the long run, I want to work more on this interface between um, software and systems and machine learning because that's an area with a lot of problems. And systems are getting more complex um, and everybody needs our help from the programmers to the administrators to the users. And uh, one of the recent developments is that instrumented systems are becoming more available. So we're able to collect more and more data from these systems. But the challenge is to <coughs> How do we make use of that data? Um, how, do we, how do we efficiently deal with large data sets? How do we deal with sampling? How do we deal with active learning problems where, uh, for instance, in, in the debugging case, maybe um, you know, if we take the user into account, if we take the user into the loop, then we can use a use user in multiple ways. We can use, it to, we can use feedback to, uh, to direct um, instrumentation uh, effort, you know, so suppose that we have a certain amount of overhead that's tolerable, uh, we might want, we, we can start with some uh, general very coarse grained instrumentation and then successively focus on the more problematic areas in the code. Or we can, we might use uh, we're already using users to sort of label the runs. Um, we can also use the users to evaluate our results and say, you know, these, these, these predicates are crap, but these other predicates seem like they're interesting. So I want to see more, more information about these two. Or the user might tell us, or the user, or maybe even some domain knowledge about the program, might tell us these predicates are actually all the same. They're all related and have some deterministic relationship. So. Um, how do we make use of that information in the learning algorithm? And there's also the problem of making more extensive use of program analysis. Um, so, so far in this approach, we haven't really touched upon, we've just dumbly treated each predicate as independent of all the others. Um, there are a lot more smart things that we can do 
um, using maybe even simple static analysis to get some limited understanding of the relationship between predicates and use that to guide diagnosis efforts or to clean up the clean up pre-process or post-process or just modify the, the, the change the learning algorithm around it. Um, there's a lot of possibilities there. So, and in general, I think it's a really exciting area. So um, I'd like to work more on that in the next few years at least. And uh, with that, that's the end of the talk. And I want to thank you for coming and asking excellent questions.